All right, so this video is going to be a little different. I don't have any notes in front of me. I don't have a script. I'm going to speak from the heart and I'm going to say some things, talk about some things that I think are very important. And the most important thing is that I think that for a lot of people, a lot of people who subscribe to this channel and for myself included, sometimes we need to take a step back, take a breath, and remember what is important. Remember what's most important, what actually matters at the end of the day. Now, this channel is about Anglicanism. All my videos so far have been about Anglican theology. What does the Anglican Church teach and why should it be believed? We're all trying to figure out what this book here, the Book of Common Prayer, what it means, what it's about. But we need to remember why does this matter? Who cares what this book says? What, what's the value that this book would actually have in eternity? And there's only one thing. There's only one value this book has. And if it doesn't have this value, it's trash. It's garbage. This book helps me to appreciate the love of Jesus Christ. That's it. If it doesn't do that, it's worthless. Because it's Jesus Christ that matters, and nothing else matters. If you're going to be saved, if Jesus Christ is going to take you to where he is, if he's going to bring you into his bosom, it's not because you're an Anglican. It's because you loved him, and you knew him, that you believed in him, that you trusted him in your life. It's not because you're Roman Catholic, you're Eastern Orthodox, you're Anglican, you're Presbyterian, you're whatever. It's that you were a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that matters. If it turned out that this book doesn't help you to appreciate the love of Jesus Christ, then there'd be no use in reading it. Of course, I happen to think it does help my relationship with Jesus. That's why I do this channel. It's not because of a love of Anglicanism per se. It's a love of Jesus. And I have found that ever since I became an Anglican six years ago, my relationship with Jesus Christ was made better. Okay, it was made richer. I appreciated the gospel more, and I feel that Anglicanism often loses its way and forgets what really matters, and I'm saying, let's get back to what we believe, okay? A question people still keep asking me, even though it was the first Theology Over Drinks video I made, why am I an Anglican? The answer I'd give now is I'm an Anglican because I believe that Anglican doctrine and Anglican liturgy helps me to appreciate the love of Jesus Christ. The Reformed theology that we find in the 39 Articles helps me to appreciate the fact that my salvation is a gratuitous gift of God, that he chose me, he gave me faith. I didn't choose to have that faith, he gave it to me. And I had a faith in Jesus Christ because Jesus wanted me to know him and because I know him, he has given me the grace in his sacraments, the grace of his church, and he is sanctifying me, he's enriching me, and in the end, he will save me. And I believe those articles help me to appreciate that. As for the Book of Common Prayer, I think the Eucharistic liturgy, I think the liturgy of the daily office beautifully encapsulates the gospel so that when I know that when I go to church on Sunday, and when I pray in my room every morning and evening with the words of this Book of Common Prayer, I'm enriched with the gospel, the distilled message of the gospel expressed liturgically. And that's why I'm an Anglican. And the point is, I'm not an Anglican because the words are beautiful. I'm not an Anglican because I like English history. I'm not an Anglican because I like Thomas Cranmer. I'm an Anglican because I love Jesus. And for me, this is how I express that in the best way. And it's how I appreciate it and understand it in the best way. 
other people join other denominations because they feel that the expression of that denomination, its formularies, its liturgies, helps them to appreciate the love of Jesus Christ. And that's great. That's absolutely fine. It's not a case of us saying we are better than them. It's a case of just us saying we're all different people and we all want to feel the love of Jesus and we want to understand it and we want to express our love for Christ. And that's what Christianity is about. And that's what denominations do because different denominations think that they have a better appreciation or a, a, a good appreciation of the gospel. And why I'm saying this is because I often feel that in, for myself, and also for many people I follow, many other Anglican people out there, and a lot of people subscribe to this channel, we can become myopic towards Anglicanism, and we can sort of think that studying Anglicanism, arguing for Anglicanism, is sort of an ends in itself. And it's not. Who cares? Okay? Who cares what Article 17 says? Who cares about what's going on in the oblation of the Eucharistic liturgy if it's not helping us to appreciate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Anglicanism is simply a bridge to something else, and that is God. And in the end, when Jesus returns, when he brings the kingdom of heaven, maybe there won't even be any more Anglicanism. It's temporal. It just exists to bring us somewhere. And that's Jesus. And we need to remember that. To step back and remember that that's what matters. And how do we know Jesus Christ chiefly? Is it in this? Book of Common Prayer? No, it's not. It's in this. The Bible. It's in Scripture. And in my Q&A video, and this is part of why I'm making this video, because I made this Q&A video, and it was great, and I enjoyed it, and I'm, and I'm proud of it, but we need, to, we need to balance this intellectual discussion about predestination, uh, Methodism, Arminianism, sacraments. Just balance it and just say, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, we can talk about that stuff, because that stuff does matter, but... Let's just rem let's remind ourselves why it matters. And I found that, and I said this in the Q&A video, a lot of people are reading quite heavy intellectual content, and they haven't read this. I, I personally know a number of individuals, and if you're watching this, you know, I'm calling you out who are reading the Summa Theologica by St. Thomas Aquinas, and they haven't read the Bible. They haven't read every book of the Bible. And I know a lot of people who could tell you who Matthew Parker was. They could tell you all about Thomas Cranmer. But if you say, if you ask them who King Josiah was, they don't know who that is. What, what, what's going on in Isaiah chapter 51? They don't know. It's okay not to know, okay? Because no one, you know, we're all on this journey together, all right? And so if you're a new Christian, of course, we can't expect you to know all the details about what happens in this very big book, collection of books. But it's just about having things in perspective, the Summa Theologica only matters in that it helps us to appreciate God and his love and his gospel. But how can you know who God is if you haven't read his word? It's in Scripture that God speaks to us. It's in Scripture that we know Jesus. God made sure of it that way. Why? Because it's it's only in Scripture that we have first-hand evidence of what Jesus said and did. Realize that? There, there, there's no other writings about Jesus that are from a first-hand eyewitness that isn't in the Scripture. Why has he made it that way? 
You know, why why has this situation occurred that allows atheists, for instance, to say Jesus was made up by the Bible? Because God has geniusly made it so that we can only know who Jesus is through the word of God in Scripture. This should be the foundation of your life. Not debating Thomas Aquinas and Anglican theology. You should be reading this every day. Every day you should be fed by the word. And if you're not doing that and you're actually spending more time arguing with people on Facebook about theology, reading pretty intense theological works, then I think there is a there's an imbalance in your actual theology and Christian life. Christianity is not a philosophy. It's not all about the intellect. It's a religion, but it's a religion that is first and foremost about a relationship. Okay, People often say, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. It's both. And the relationship is the most important thing. And I find that in my life and in every person's life I've seen who's like me, if you get too stuck in intellectualism and theology, your relationship with Jesus Christ does suffer. Why does that happen? I don't know. I don't know. I think there's a lot of reasons why it happens. I think we can just lose sight of the goal. You know? We're focusing too much on the road itself and not on the destination, which is which is Jesus Christ. And I've been thinking about this stuff a lot lately. I made an uh, article on my blog just two days ago about what I called meme Christianity, which I'm getting uh, quite sick and tired of as well, where it's almost the opposite of this intellectual version. It's, it's a focus on, on meme culture as your expression of, of Christianity. It's all about the aesthetics and posting icons on Facebook and making memes about saints and making fun of other denominations. And that's sort of the main way you're expressing your faith. Especially in this COVID world where everyone's in lockdown and we're not able to go to physical church as much and we're stuck before a computer screen all the time and our faith is becoming sort of internetified <laughs> where we're expressing our faith through social media and can be very damaging. What I'd suggest is before you turn on the computer, before you pick up whatever theological tome you're reading through, get on your knees in prayer and read the Word of God. In John 17, Jesus says to the Father in, in prayer, He says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your Word is truth. He says also, in John, at, at, during the Last Supper, he says, you have already been made clean by the word I have spoken to you. The word itself sanctifies us in a mystical way. Even if we're just reading through Scripture, and, and even if it's not speaking to us as much as sometimes it is, it actually sanctifies us. It, it's actually doing something. Just, just by being in the presence of the word, we're being sanctified because we're literally in God's presence, because it's his word. So just, just remember what's important. Now, another reason I want to make this video, another thing I want to talk about, of course, is, well, we have Bishop uh, Nazir Ali the, uh, in England. He, he has swam the Tiber and become a Roman Catholic, and he was a beloved conservative bishop in the Anglican world. And then just last night for me, I found out that Christian Wagner, who we've, we've had on this channel before, uh, has also swam the Tiber. Not a shock to me. I, I've seen that coming for a long time. And I want to talk about that as well. I, I don't, I honestly don't know much about Nazir Lee, but as for Christian Wagner and people debating whether they should become Roman Catholic. And I'm sure that there are many people watching this video 
who are considering such a thing. I just want to say, well, remember what matters most. It's not what club you're in. It's about your appreciation, your apprehension of the gospel. That's what matters. Spiritual maturity doesn't mean joining another denomination. Spiritual maturity means growing in your understanding and appreciation and reciprocation of Jesus Christ's love for you as expressed in the gospel. For me personally, I would I'd say that if I was to become a Roman Catholic, I would not think that that was a spiritually mature decision, or I don't think that that would reveal spiritual maturity. Why? Because I think the Roman Catholic Church has an impoverished understanding of the love of God. And that's why the Reformation happened. The Council of Trent is crystal clear that your works increase your justification and that if you sin, you lose your justification. It says that. It says, actually says if you say that sinning doesn't make you lose your justification, you're anathema. It says in the Council of Trent, that if you sin, the only way to have your justification restored to you is to have absolution by a priest. Why is that an impoverished understanding of the gospel? Because as far as I understand it, the gospel says you are a sinner. It's not that you sin. It's that you are a sinner. And that means that you will sin. But despite that, despite your depravity, the Holy Father loves you. He chose you. He poured his spirit into your heart. He gave you a faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And by the blood, the precious blood of Jesus, you have been washed. And that means you are holy. You are righteous. You are justified. I'd encourage you to read 1 Corinthians and pay attention to a very important detail. St. Paul, at the start of 1 Corinthians, says to them, You are holy. You are sanctified. God sanctified you. Then what does St. Paul do in 1 Corinthians? He goes on about how this church is depraved. They're a bunch of sinners. And at times, they completely misunderstand everything. They don't even understand the Eucharist. He says to them, that's not the, last, the, that's not the Lord's Supper you're taking. But he says, you're holy. You're sanctified. Throughout Scripture, St. Paul especially encourages his followers. Well, they're not his followers. But he encourages his flock to grow in their understanding and appreciation of the surpassing, the, the transcendent, the unknowable riches of God's grace. Christianity is about living out in time what we are in eternity. And in eternity, we are in Christ. We are predestined to be in Christ. God predestined you to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. If you've been baptized and you have a faith in Jesus, you are in Jesus, you are in him, that is an ontological reality. And that reality doesn't go away. God makes a promise to you. You are in Christ, and you are justified in him. You participate in his righteousness. Just read, just read Philippians chapter 3, verse 2 to 11, especially verse 9. You have the righteousness of Christ. You are in him because of your faith. He does not take it away. God knows that you're a sinner. So why would he say, I'm going to take this thing away if you sin? He knows that you're going to sin. That's what you are. I don't think the Roman Catholic Church has a proper appreciation of this. Okay? That doesn't mean that Roman Catholics, and I know many of them, don't appreciate it. A lot of them do. 
It's just about the doctrines of the church. And I wonder if you're to go away from Anglicanism, go to Roman Catholicism, I wonder what's going on. Okay, because I, I know that there are people who become Roman Catholic and that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to all of a sudden say everything the Roman Catholic Church has ever said is infallibly true, like it claims for itself, but many of them do. And so if you're going from a reformed position of justification by faith alone, and you're going into a system, and that means that you are now going to believe in a Council of Trent soteriology, I wonder if your maturity is not increasing. It's actually being degraded by a misunderstanding of Jesus Christ. And why would that happen? Why does this happen to people? It's because they've been myopic about what matters. Ecclesiology doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things in comparison to soteriology, okay, to to the gospel, to how we're saved. Do you think that we're saved for being Anglicans? Do you think we're saved for being Roman Catholic? We're saved for loving Christ. People just get so focused on these little details. I'm not saved because my priest the other day absolved me. Why am I saved? Because I know that I have faith in God, and I know that I'm so depraved, I'm so stupid, right, that I didn't choose to have that faith. I was given it. I, I don't know why, and, and there, there, there isn't a reason. It's unconditional. It's unconditional. For whatever reason... And his own good counsel, secret to us, God chose me and he chose you to have faith. And that he, he poured his spirit into your heart to do that. And he has ontologically united you to his son. And that ain't changing. And it's not dependent on what denomination you're in. Okay? That's what, that's what matters, and that's what needs to be said, I think. Ecclesiology is important. But if you have talked yourself and you've thought yourself into a situation where you truly think that you're not a justified person, if you're not in that church down the road and getting absolved by that priest down there, then I think you need to reflect on what actually matters the most. Okay? Our love for Christ. Christ's love for us. Is that growing in your life? Because the people I, I know who get too focused on theology, especially ecclesiology, okay, it's always ecclesiology, about apostolic succession, sacraments, priests, bishops, they become bitter. They just become bitter. Have you noticed that too? On on social media, it's always the people who all they want to talk about is ecclesiology can be very bitter people. And and I've become like that too. When I was at my height of worrying about ecclesiology, and I have to say, uh, uh, a year and a half ago, I was seriously considering becoming Roman Catholic. Okay. It's because I got I got too myopic about ecclesiology, and I thought, oh my gosh, how can the church be divided? How can there be different denominations? Surely there's only one church, there's only one denomination. Maybe this whole pope, pope idea does actually make sense, even though it's not in like historical Christianity at all, right? But maybe it makes sense, and um, and 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 had had a security to it, had answers to it. You should go there. Everything the church has taught is true, even though it constantly contradicts itself throughout history. And uh, there's a pope, and so you can look to him as this figurehead, even though sometimes the Roman Catholic Church hasn't even known who's the pope, and although popes have said heretical things. But okay, it gives you security. And I got so focused on it, and as I was getting more and more focused on ecclesiology, I became bitter because my relationship with Christ suffered. It did suffer because I took away from the simple purity of the fact that God has poured his love into my heart through his spirit 
and called me to believe in his son. I took that away and I, I replaced it instead with my church. What line of apostolic succession does it have? Um, my priest, was he validly ordained? Let's go back to the Edwardian ordinal. Is the form of the ordinal correct for for bishops to actually be bishops and therefore for my priest to be a real priest and therefore for the absolution I receive on Sunday to be valid? <laughs> Ugh. That's not the gospel. That's not it. That's not what this is about. And I got bitter about it. And I was stuck in this, in this trench for so long. Point is, guys... Just remember Jesus. Who who do you want to follow? Are, are you following a denomination? Or are you following Christ? And, and for you watching this video to, today, you who's watching this video right now, ask yourself this. Did you read the Bible today? Did you pray to God today? I don't know how long this video is going to be. It, it's apparently been recording for 36 minutes. Couldn't you have been spent that better in, in prayer to God, reading his word? Okay, that's what matters the most. And I hope, it's my hope, that this channel, that the content that I produce, that the, the articles I write on my blog, that all I'm trying to do is help you to appreciate that and to, and to see, as I've seen, that Anglicanism can help you to understand the gospel to express your love for Christ, and to receive grace. That, that's, that's all I care about. All I care about is your growing understanding of the gospel. And I hope that I've done that for some of you. And what I don't want to do and what I'm worried about is that I am making people focus too much on Anglican theology to the detriment of why that matters. I've seen it in my life. I've seen people who come to have faith in Jesus and then they go, okay, I have faith in Jesus. Now what? What denomination what do I align myself with? And then very quickly, they're in this pit of being obsessed with ecclesiology and and all these different aspects of theology and what they end up doing is they they dissect and they pick apart and they lose sight of their faith and they lose sight of what matters most and that simple and pure devotion that they had for Jesus Christ in the beginning goes away and they just they just get bogged down by all this stuff that does matter if it helps you to appreciate the goal, but they, they focus on that and they lose sight of everything. I've seen this happen time and time again. And we have to say to people, hey, 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 remember before you got really interested in, in the differences between Anglicanism and Roman Catholicism, just that simple love you had for Jesus, where it was just about you and God and the Bible. Remember that? What happened to that? Oh, yeah, but it's, it's really important that we understand. Yeah, it is important that we understand that, but it's, it, it's important for a reason. And so that's what I want to do here in this video. I just want you to remember what matters most.